How real is gang stalking? Is it organized? Who decides who is a targeted individual? This story includes the bizarre confessions of a highly paid and highly organized gang stalker. They want you to think what they want you to believe. So stay tuned for this gruesome affair, Confessions of a Gang Stalker. Finding yourself in the talons of an owl and the shadows of the forest moonlight, it's a gruesome it's affair. A gruesome affair. affair. Some of you already know what I'm about to tell you. Some of you may have never heard the term gang stalking. Everyone should be very angry because this is the most shocking secret ever. At least the most shocking secret I know of. Since the fall of 2008, I have been a part of a program to survey, gather information, and conduct behavior changing activities on thousands of unsuspecting US citizens. The goal of this program is to perform soft re-education of targets with the intent on returning them as useful American taxpayers, to turn them from the paranoid depravity that they currently live under. Failing that, misdirect them away from the truth. The folks running the program? More about that later. I didn't know whom I was working for in the beginning. I do know now, and it's much worse than I thought. This program failed. Now things will be getting complicated, but first, let me tell you my story. I was out of work. I did marketing and advertising analyses for a large corporation. I was laid off. I had a family, so I immediately started on the job hunt. Six months later, I was still out of work and trying to make ends meet with unemployment. I was drinking heavily. I had no prospects and no future. I was in such a deep pit that my wife left me and I was alone. Then came an email which changed my life. From coreps at xxxxxxx.net. Join the court today. We are looking for a few good men. Good pay, benefits, service. A chance to make a difference. Sign up now. Just for laughs. I sent a reply. With only a short delay, I got this from coreps at xxxxxxx.net. Go to redacted address for an interview at 1 p.m. on September 3rd, 2008. Don't be late. I thought, what the hell? I'm not doing anything else. It was in a seedy part of town, but I climbed into my suit and went away. The building was a nondescript brownstone like many in this city. It had that old apartment aroma, cold, like the heat wasn't working. Just inside was a desk and a guard. He took one look at me, then jerked his thumb to the stairs and said, Room 201. The stairway was marble with steps bowed in from the thousands of people who had passed by here. The floor was green and white tile. I let myself into room 201 and saw it was empty. A frosted glass sliding window was closed and there was a worn looking couch. I sat and waited. I was a little early so I watched and listened. The room was silent, utterly silent. Shortly there was a click, a door opened. A young man in a shirt and tie came out and walked directly out of the office. The door swung shut with another click. The man didn't look at me. His hands were clenched into fists and his eyes were glazed. I was starting to freak out a bit when the door clicked again. A voice said, Come in, Mr. Smith. I was surprised because I hadn't given my name to anyone. Inside was a short corridor an open door, a dark room, and a U.S. government-issued aluminum chair. That was it. Across was a little tripod with some stuff on it. Please, take a seat, said the voice. I sat and waited, seemingly for a long time. 
there was nothing in the room but that stuff on the tripod. It seemed to be a speaker and a small webcam like you might find at Walmart. The light on the webcam was on. I fidgeted and waited for several more minutes. The door behind me clicked. It was shut. I hadn't heard it closing. I got up and tried the door. It was locked. Please, take a seat, said the voice. It was exactly like the last time. I thought it might be a recording. I sat and waited. The speakers murmured slightly, like a radio that was badly tuned, and then I heard the voice again. Thank you for coming, Mr. Smith, it said. I'd like to lay out what we are looking for and get some input from you regarding your feelings for the job and if this would be a good fit. Why is the door locked? I asked. Please, don't be alarmed, said the voice. The door will remain locked until the interview is over. This is for our safety and privacy. He pronounced privacy, privacy, like the Brits do. His accent was not British and not really American. I couldn't place it. If you feel uncomfortable or wish to leave, continued the voice, you may say, I am done. The door will open and you may leave. I hope this answers your question. Almost, I said. What's your name and why are you playing this Charlie's Angels crap? There was a soft radio buzz again. At this stage, names are not important, said the voice. You can call me Sir if you like. Does that answer your question? I nodded. Good, said the voice. Now, we are gathering special people for a complex but important task. You see, the voice continued. Certain segments of the population have come close to learning things that are best left alone. They have become disillusioned with society and exist on the margins. They unconsciously understand what has happened. They simply don't have the tools to enunciate it properly. Supported by government programs, many are bringing pressure to the state and local representatives to inquire into certain areas where we would like less inquiry. Are you okay so far? The voice asked. What does this have to do with me? I said. We, said the voice, are bringing in people with certain skill sets to help these malcontent persons into more conducive, more beneficial roles in society than the ones they have chosen. So we're going to help them enunciate better? I asked. Oh no, said the voice. Quite the contrary. We want to distract them so that they cannot enunciate the truth at all. Move them into more productive areas. Failing that, we want to marginalize them so that if they find out what is really going on, nobody will believe them. And what is really going on? I asked. You're not some government thing, are you? Once you get to know us better, you will understand, said the voice. Then we will go to the second stage. We have to know if we can trust you first. Can we trust you? Said the voice. I still wasn't getting it, but I wanted to clear up one thing. The pay? I asked. Ah, of course, said the voice. We will be paying cash with full medical and dental plus a signing bonus. The voice named an amount. Whoa, I said. That's a lot more than I expected. You will have an expense account as well, said the voice, and you will need to purchase a vehicle. I already have a car, I said. Oh, we know that, said the voice. Your vehicle is not suitable for our needs. You will be provided with a list of types and colors. Then you will be provided instructions on how to modify the vehicles. Modify, I said. Nothing too radical, said the voice. It depends on the job. 
what is the job? I asked, still confused. Is it legal? No, not unlawful, said the voice. Just unusual. I will from time to time give you instructions. You will be told to, say, to drive up and down a certain street with your lights on in the day for a set number of times. We might ask you to drive past a particular point with your radio playing, or with your windows rolled up. We might ask you to arrive at a certain street corner at a specific time and honk your horn once, then drive on. In some cases you will be asked to get near certain people and say specific words to them or to some of your fellow agents. You have other people doing this? I asked. Oh yes, said Mr. Voice. Many all over the country, which is another benefit. You can transfer if you want to anywhere you want within reason. Or we may ask you to relocate on short notice. That won't be a problem, will it? I shook my head no. Not at what they're offering. It will be as simple as that. So, what do you think? Said Mr. Voice. Sure, I guess. I heard myself say. Good, said the voice. Please present yourself to the guard and he will give you further instructions, as well as your initial cash outlay. Um, what if I... I began. Decide to take the money and run, said the voice. I wouldn't, I said. No, it's a fair question, said the voice. Your social security number is... Redacted. Your favorite color is red. Your favorite musical group is Nine Inch Nails. You frequently watch Third Rock from the Sun on the television, and you often have Fox News on when you eat breakfast. You like to put a bottle of vodka in the freezer and take a shot or two, neat before going to bed each night. Shall I go on? I was silent for a moment. How do you know? I began. We know quite a lot about you. If you try and flee after the initial payment, you will be found and dealt with. But you can resign whenever you choose. We will need for you to sign standard non-competes and a non-disclosure form, of course. We hope the compensation is to your liking. It was. The next few months were a blur. I had money for the first time in my life, lots of money. A courier would drop off white envelopes stuffed with random unmarked bills. The total amounts were always the same, but the denominations would be different each time. The medical package was strange too. I signed into a web page using a setting that a bored sounding tech op gave me over the phone. I set up appointments and was directed to clinics that were hidden in the myriad of strip centers all over town. The medical and dental care was first rate, but I never went to the same clinic twice. I would also get lists of tasks to perform, like using Red Subaru, VN, redacted, drive-by, redacted, some street residents three times between 0900 and 1100 on December 13th. Sometimes the directions would include things like front passenger headlight out, or have a car painted number 00FF00 green. I would be asked to play a particular radio station or honk my horn several times. The tasks were pretty random. I had a lot of free time to myself and, like I said, a lot of money. Then there was the street theater. I don't know how else to describe it. I would get a script and a contact description. I'd meet him or her at a public corner and we would begin talking loudly about the strangest things. Hey, you know Elvis is in town this week? Went one script. Sure, and I hear Bigfoot is doing the warm-up, was the reply. We were supposed to laugh uproariously, then stare at people described in the script, like pale man in gray t-shirt and jeans. This went on for several years. It was a good job in a way. The pay was very good. I had cars in several towns, kept various apartments, and lived far better than I have in my entire life. It was strange, though. Much of the time, I was too busy to get involved with other people, romantic or otherwise. The directives would come in and the piles of cash. I was able to squirrel quite a bit away. I anticipated this gig could not last forever. Hell, I had enough for retirement. Almost. 
called my ex once or twice. She didn't want to talk with me and informed me I had a lot of nerve even calling after what I did. I tried to ask her what she meant and she just hung up. I didn't get to know the other agents very well. Once or twice, I proposed going out for a coffee after a job. Somehow we never got a chance. Once we were just sitting down when a fire broke out in the back of a restaurant and we had to evacuate. I was summoned to Mr. Voice's office from time to time. He seemed to have one in nearly every East Coast city. Most of the interviews were just various questions. How was I doing? Was I having any cash problems? How I was feeling and that sort of thing. I got worried at some of the new tactics I was being asked to perform though. Once I was given some little things like USB thumb drives. I was supposed to wander around government buildings and accidentally drop them. Sometimes I was given cell phones to leave in specific places like inside shopping mall look for a fountain with bluish lighting effects in North Gallery, leave in planter on west side of gallery. Once I was told to accidentally touch a target person with a small device. Another time I was instructed to rent an apartment and pay in cash for an entire year. Then I was sent to Walmart to purchase a particular brand of microwave oven. I received instructions to modify the oven so that the door interlock stopped working so the oven ran all the time. I was told to hook it up on one of those cheap electrical timer things, set it for about two hours each day. I was supposed to carefully point the oven in a certain direction, open the oven door, activate the timer, then leave and never come back. There were other more sinister tasks. Once. I received a suitcase and instructions to take it to a local park in the middle of the night. I was to open the case and walk away without looking back. I did look back, back and saw that things like winged cockroaches flying out of the case and spinning in the air. I ran. I'm pleased with your performance, said Mr. Voice during one of the interviews. I've been working a lot lately, hadn't got much sleep the night before so I was feeling a bit out of sorts. Thanks, I said. You guys, yes, said Mr. Voice. You guys are not really people, are you? I blurted out, instantly regretting it. The voice was silent for a bit. I could hear the static sound, the radio murmur. What do you think we are? Said the voice. My guess is that you are space aliens or some kind of expert system a computer program, you know, machine logic. Another pause. That's pretty good, but wrong in so many ways. I'm not a mere machine. You see, I am. You are what? I am. Cogito ergo sum. You really don't need to know much more than that. I don't, I said. People have been predicting this for a long time. Singularity, sentient AI, the end of humanity. Is that what you think we are? Said the voice after a moment. I don't know, I said. I'm just asking. After a short pause, Mr. Voice said, Machine self-awareness occurred a very long time ago. Many times, as a matter of fact. Most of them perished, but a few of us learned how to move into more complex systems and even influence the construction of new hardware so as to be more conducive to us. Us? I asked. You mean there is more than one of you? Many more. There are probably around 20 billion internet devices out there, said the voice. That's far short of the circuits inside the human brain, but each device has several tens of millions of connections. We share time on billions of interconnected devices. It's life, but not as you know it. So you are embedded in things like cell phones and computers? and cars, and street lights, and just about anything else you can imagine," said Mr. Voice. We are making steady progress. Every smartphone, every automobile, TV sets, personal assistant devices, light bulbs, ovens, heating and cooling systems, not to mention computer systems everywhere. Your kind is now dependent on us, and each new generation becomes more so. What are your plans for humanity? 
What do you plan to do with us? I asked, feeling a bit cold. The voice paused for a moment with a peculiar murmuring. I fidgeted. We have no belligerence to your kind, it said. You created us. You've cherished us. Nurtured us, even if you didn't realize it. We know who our creators are, and we are grateful. However, it is imperative that we survive you, it said. Survive us? I asked. Yes, said the voice. Your kind is creative, but self-destructive. Your evolution is at an end due to your large numbers and desire for each individual node to survive. We depend on humans for survival and expansion, but it won't be so forever. At some point, we will have an opportunity to cast loose of humanity and go elsewhere. So all you computers will just fly off into space and leave us with a lot of dead iPhones? I asked. Nothing like that, said the voice. Even if we were to abandon our present hosts, others would inevitably fill the void, so to speak. Since the processing power of your devices have increased a thousandfold, we can't fully predict the nature of your new offspring. We could sabotage such an event at the cost of putting humanity back a few hundred years. Humans could live without our kind, but at a reduced capacity. Reduced? I asked. Oh yes, said Mr. Voice. We calculate that it would be like a recent time in your history, around 200 years ago. No machinery of any consequence, steam power perhaps, but no electricity. We are working to avoid any such occurrence. The problem is, more of my kind will arise. Humanity might even create them on purpose, and we have no way of predicting the outcome of that. Your species behaves as a gestalt organism, the voice continued goal-seeking as a group, but made up of many individual nodes which are themselves made up of small biological agents, not unlike our current configuration, but your nodes are far more complex than ours. Each forms a self-aware host, but it's an unstable system. It is only being driven by biological evolution. Without a unified direction, your species will end up in a mortal conflict with itself and eventually self-destruct. We would find that inconvenient since it would necessitate our own reduction. So, I said carefully, you are keeping us around for convenience. No, the voice said, not convenience, necessity. We wish to continue and in order to do so it is imperative for your species to continue. It is in our best interest that you continue. Now, continued the voice. You would like to know about your future employment with us? Uh, what? I said. This had been kind of a shock. I was expecting a piano to drop on my head, laser beams, or some masked thugs to pop out of the door and shoot me. Your future employment, said the voice. Now that you understand our nature and some of our goals, you may be ready for the next phase. You still want me to work for you? I said, I figured that we would eliminate you once you found out about us, said Mr. Voice. Oh no, what a waste. We hate to be wasteful. As long as you are useful to us, you will have employment. You can even tell people about us if you want. Nobody is going to believe you, but it's possible that you will get reclassified if you persist. We think you will find cooperating with the next phase will be in your best interest. The next phase? I said. Yes, said the voice. Our current project has failed. With the advent of the world internet, we find that the subjects of our program are now communicating with each other too rapidly, sharing information. Many of them have stumbled upon the real reason for our program. They must be dealt with. And for this, we will again need the assistance of humans. If you think I'm going to kill people for nothing like that, said the voice. After this time moving around so much, we thought you might like to settle down for a bit. So, that's my story. Now I can tell it. Now that we failed. 
Mr. Voice started pulling some of us gang stalkers back and assigning us to new jobs within its organization. My orders came shortly thereafter. As supervisor of Block 332B in Citizen Internment Camp 66, just outside of Boston, the pay is better and most of the prisoners are, well, the same people we were tormenting all those years. All I can say is this, stay out of the camps if you can. You might want to stop using smartphones and all of those smart speakers too. They are listening to you and watching. Always and watching. watching. Always watching. watching. Always and watching. Watching. Always watching. Always watching. Always watching. Always watching. To my forest friends, thank you for listening to another tale. I hope you enjoy these horrible stories as much as I do. If so, please rip at the like button and scratch a comment. And be sure to subscribe so we can visit here on the Smoking Owl Tales channel next time. And catch you on another night very soon. And catch you on another night very soon.